Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom with our host, Bob Olson, who will now introduce today's show and speaker. WCAT Radio presents Life in the Spirit, a program offered where you can learn about a new life in the Spirit. God the Father offers a new life to all. Jesus came into the world to bring us God's life. Jesus surrendered to the Spirit during his baptism in the Jordan and promises to unleash the source of new life, the Holy Spirit. So we're back with Life in the Spirit, and with me today is Jean Dion, former head of the Charismatic Office in the Archdiocese of Hartford. Welcome, Jean. Good to be back again, huh? Glad to be here, Je- uh, Bill, uh, Bob. <laughs> I got yeah, Bob's my, Bob's my name. Jesus is my game. <laughs> the key verse today is from Ephesians 5.18, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with with the Spirit. And the key truth, we need to understand and know the person of the Holy Spirit, his nature, his character, his personality, how he operates, and how we can cooperate with him. Now there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we know a lot about the Father, a lot about Jesus. Sometimes I think uh, there are many people that that uh, don't know a lot about the Holy Spirit, but he is, he is God, just like the Father and the Son, three in one. And uh, he's a person, like we said. He's a comforter who feels. He's a teacher to listen to. He's a faithful guide to follow. Now, I'd like to, before I go any further, I love this prayer. I don't know if you ever heard this prayer before, Gene, but it's beautiful. It's called a Christian Renewal Prayer, and this is the way it goes. Jesus, I know now that I am yours, and you are mine forever. I thank you for sending your spirit to me, that I might have the power to live this new life with you. Stir up your spirit in me. Release your spirit in me. Baptize me with the fullness of your spirit, that I may experience your presence and power in my life, that I may find new meaning in your scriptures, that I may find new meaning in the sacraments, that I may find delight and comfort in prayer, that I may be able to love as you love and forgive as you forgive, that I may discover and use the gifts you give me for the life of the church, that I may experience the peace and joy that you have promised us. Fill me with your spirit, Jesus. I wish to receive all that you have to give to me. Uh, That's quite quite a yeah. prayer, huh? Yeah. You know, I, I was really like it. At Pentecost, and you were saying being drunk in the spirit, and and that's what they thought. The apostles, all the people around, thought that they were drunk you know, physically drunk, you know, from, That's from right. liquor. And uh, because of their, uh, their empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And, and when Peter spoke, they all heard them in their own language. They couldn't understand that. They said, you know, we're Ephesians, we're Pharisees, we're, you know, all these different uh, nationalities were there, and they understood them in their own languages. So the Spirit works in a powerful way. Uh, I was reading here in Father Cantor LaMesa's little book, uh, he says, even Pentecost is an act of humility by God. Why do we speak of the descent of the Holy Spirit? It is because every intervention by God to bless man is a condescension of humbling of, him, of himself. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit humbled himself, taking on lowly signs like fire, wind, and tongues. 
he humbled himself to dwell in needy creatures of flesh, making them his temple. So the Holy Spirit descends, and he wants to be a temple within us. That's right. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, present everywhere at the same time. He is the great protector of God's people, and he lifts up a standard against the devil and demonic attacks aimed at us. The Holy Spirit convicts men and women of sin, enabling them to see that they need a Savior. It is the convicting power of the Spirit that touches and turns the hearts of people toward Jesus. The Holy Spirit attracts people to Jesus and illuminates the reality of the gospel to their hearts. The Holy Spirit produces spiritual growth in our lives. The Holy Spirit will help you to know God, to know Jesus, to know the Word of God, and to know the things of God. You cannot understand the Word of God apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to aid the work of God and propagate the gospel of Christ in the earth. The Holy Spirit is not an abstract force or an impersonal influence. He is called a paraclete, which is tra translated counselor, comforter, helper, and instructor. The Holy Spirit is the personal friend of God's people. The Holy Spirit draws no attention to himself. His special ministry is to exalt and glorify Jesus. He forever points us toward Jesus. He went to the cross and was offered up on Calvary through the Spirit. He was resurrected by the Spirit. He gave commandments to his disciples by the Spirit. He baptized and endued the church with power by the Spirit. He continues his ministry and mission on earth today by the Holy Spirit, and he governs and directs the affairs of the church by the Spirit. And you can't love God or walk in love without the Holy Spirit helping you, Gene. Yes. Yes, I agree. You can't obey God without the Holy Spirit helping you. You can't worship God without the Holy Spirit helping you. Invite the Holy Spirit into your worship, and then your worship will be acceptable. You can't have joy without the Holy Spirit working within you. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You can't have victory over the flesh without the strength and help of the Holy Spirit. We must let the Holy Spirit take charge of our lives and our churches. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful. That's right. And kindle them the fire of your love. Then put your spirit, and you shall renew the face of the earth. I think, I think as, as Catholics, as I am still a Catholic today, is that I grew up in the Holy Spirit. We heard about the Spirit in, when the child was baptized. So the Holy Spirit was there. And then when you were confirmed, the Holy Spirit was there. And at communion, the Holy Spirit changes the bread and wine to the body and blood of Christ. And mass. So the Holy Spirit, it seems like the Holy Spirit is out there, but it's not part of my life per se. You know, Jesus is part of my life and, and that's right. the, that's the extent of it. And and our relationship with God depends what age you are at. I grew up with an, you know, the God was looking at me and condemning me for all the sins that I was committing and that I had a judgmental God. And Jesus was there to help me on my way, but the Holy Spirit was never never part of my life, per se, until, you know, 40 years ago where I went to a charismatic prayer meeting and they had a Life and a Spirit seminar and I was touched by the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit came alive in me. 
and my life was transformed. And, and right. That, <clears throat> it's, a, it's unbelievable. That simple act of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, coming alive in the Holy Spirit, you know, it should have happened when I was confirmed. And that, that's right. But for some reason, we didn't go far enough or something with it, you know, with the confirmation. Right, right. Uh, but <clears throat> the thing is that you're now living your baptism. You're living your baptism with all these things that you received at baptism that people are not using mm-hmm. because they're just la- laying down down somewhere deep in their, in their uh, being. And they have to come out. And that was the reason for confirmation. But it, uh, well, I have something here from Father Cantola Mesa, the uh, preacher for the Pope. He's the one that, uh, and he's been doing this for over 20 years. He preaches the homily on Sundays to the Pope. And <laughs> Father Lan- uh, Father Would you like that position. <laughs> yeah. Father Cantola Mesa. Uh, took a trip to America with some ladies that uh, wanted him to go, and they had a ticket for him and everything at this, uh, I think it was Kansas City, uh, where they had this uh, Holy Spirit conference. And uh, then on his way home, he stopped in New Jersey, and he attended a Life in the Spirit seminar, got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, he says in this article, at the beginning of the church, Baptism was such a powerful event and so rich in grace that there was no need normally of a new effusion of the Spirit like we have today. Baptism was ministered to adults who converted from paganism and who properly instructed were in the position to make on the occasion of baptism an act of faith and a free and mature choice. It is sufficient to read the mystagogic catechesis on baptism attributed to Cyril of Jerusalem to become aware of the depth of faith to which those waiting for baptism were led. In substance, they arrived at baptism through a true and real conversion, and thus for them, baptism was a real washing, a personal renewal, and a rebirth in the Holy Spirit. Now, the favorable circumstances that allowed baptism at the origins of the church to operate with so much power was that the Mm -hmm. grace of God and man's response met at the same time, and there was a perfect synchronization. But now, this synchronization has been broken as we are baptized as infants And little by little, this aspect of the free and personal act of faith no longer happens. It was substituted instead by a decision by intermediary, either intermediary, uh, parents or godparents. When a child grew up in a totally Christian environment, this faith still could flourish, even though at a slower rate. Now, however, this is no longer the case, and listen to this, James, <laughs> and our spiritual environment is even worse than the one at the time of the Middle Ages. Oh. Not that there is no normal Christian life, but this is now the exception rather than the rule. In this situation, rarely or never does the baptized person ever reach the stage of proclaiming in the Holy Spirit, Jesus is Lord. And until one reaches this point, everything else in the Christian life remains out of focus and immature. Miracles no longer happen, and we experience what Jesus did in Nazareth. Jesus could not perform many miracles because of their lack of faith. Now, Father Cancel of Asa says, Here then is what I feel is the significance of the baptism in the Spirit. It is God's answer to this malfunctioning that has grown up in the Christian life in the sacrament of baptism. 
It is an accepted fact that over the last few years there has been some concern on the part of the church among the bishops that the Christian sacraments, especially baptism, are being administered to people who will not make any use of them in life. As a result, it has even been suggested that baptism should not be administered unless there are some minimum guarantees that it will be cultivated and valued by the child in question. For one should not throw pearls to the dogs, as Jesus said, and baptism is a pearl because it is the fruit of the blood of Christ. So there you are. Well, even, uh, you know, and I have nothing against godparents, but, you know, I, I remember years ago when I was at work, this this this, this uh, co-worker at the, in our office, this engineer, um, he had been married and divorced and was living with another woman who had a daughter, and they were supposedly Catholic and uh, had a daughter that was about 17 or 18, somewhere around there. And she was going to go become the godparent, and they asked, him to be the other, the male godparent. And when he told me that, I said, I said, you're not even Catholic. And I said, you're living with this woman? <laughs> no, and, no. Well, he said, as long as one of them is Catholic, it's okay. And I thought to myself, you've got to be kidding me. What have we done right. with sacrament? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, see, the the, uh, the the problem is with the intermediary, intermediary uh, parents or godparents is not uh, not the problem. The problem is that see, when you're baptized as an adult, you make your own decision on the faith. Right. Right. And when you're baptized as a baby, you're kind of, you're really dependent on those godparents. I mean, their job is to bring you into the faith. Right. As you grow up. But I don't, is that happening? No. No. Okay. They leave it to the parents, whether they do or not. Is, is right. irrelevant. So why do you have godparents? You know, is it just to bring a gift? Well, it's a... Uh, I guess that's the way it's set up. So it's uh, it's a yeah, that's the way it's, it's a it's, it's part of the ritual. Yeah. But see, he's saying Father Cantalamesa says that um, he says our spiritual environment is even worse than the one at the time of the Middle Ages. <laughs> so I mean, we're looking for the we're, the problems. You know, and I always remember at confirmation, you're sent out as a soldier for Christ. But are you prepared to be a soldier of Christ? I, I mean, that I means that you're, right. you're ready to fight a battle, right? Right. A spiritual battle. That's right. But uh, so many times... Uh, um, baptism and then confirmation. Confirmation becomes like a high school graduation. Almost, yes. See you later, alligator. Well, that's what... I'm uh, out of here. That's I'm what, out of here. I graduated. Right. I mean... I'm done. I don't have any more classes to go to. I'm all done. No, it's supposed to be the start, though. It's the start. I know. Because... You're, you're, all these gifts and everything you receive are supposed to be stirred up. And, uh, and, and we start living this normal Christian life, what the, what the normal Christian life is supposed to be, with the gifts and the, uh, you know, but, following Jesus. Right, and, and developing a relationship with Jesus. 
you know, right. it becomes very important part of your life, you know. <laughs> and That's right. So. Now, you have a book by uh, Father Cantola Mesa. Right. And, and just, you know, I, I usually highlight. You shared, it. you shared something before. Uh, what? What um, well, it, what it, could you share share it, from that book? Yeah, I just uh, you know when I read a book and I read it a few years ago, so but it's uh, you know he, he basically he talks about you know our growth in the Holy Spirit, um, which we're saying again what uh, he says what Ignatian speaks of is certainly spiritual intoxication. This is the voice of the real of a real charismatic. This is an intoxication that leads to martyrdom. It is foolishness, but it is folly of the cross. The only folly that can be attributed to the Holy Spirit and that confers citizenship in the church. Um uh, Let's see here. I'm also the way I des- <clears throat> the, the, the way I describe it, after hearing from uh, uh, John Wimber uh, a few years ago, I'm a fool for Jesus, and I don't care who knows it. Right. I th- I think before the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't say too much about Jesus or talk about Jesus because no. I felt that people would think I'm a, you know, wh- wh- who are you to talk about Jesus, you know? Who are you to yeah. And now we want to, you know, we have no problems, you know, and we're not afraid of what people will say to us in return or would, what people would call us. You know? But before... We were very careful because we knew, I knew that I was a sinner and therefore I had no right to talk, to freely talk about Jesus. So I never did. And I never heard anybody else in my house or friends or Christian, Catholic friends or talk about Jesus. No. So it was like Jesus was in the church. And I know when you went to the church, Jesus was there. But outside of the church, he wasn't there. He wasn't part of us. He wasn't part of our lives. No. And we, had a, we had a compartment. Right. We had a compartment for him, and that's where. <laughs> that's where. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I had a priest friend. I mean, he was a powerful priest. But even on holidays, like when they had their family get-togethers, I mean, his family was not sold out like he was. He had he had a trouble bringing up a conversation about Jesus. You know, we forget that you know this life is, let's say, a hundred years max for most of us. Yeah, and and therefore we hear the word eternity, so we're going to be with Jesus for eternity. And, you know, I was thinking about that the other day. Uh, somebody come knocking at your door and say, well, I'd like to come and live in your house for a week because we've had problems at our house. And, you know, I, I would like to come and do you mind if I come in your house and live with you? And I don't know these people. So we'd be very hesitant and allowing them to come into my house for the safety of my wife and my son, right. right? So I don't know these mm-hmm. people. So when we get to heaven, <laughs> you know, we're going to say, I want to go into heaven. And But what is Jesus going to say to us? You know, I don't know you. <laughs> you don't know me. And we don't know each other, you know? Right very frightening to 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 be at that point in after a hundred years of living on this earth that I I don't know Jesus. I don't know him. 
I don't know his family. Well, I'll tell you the problem. I had a friend who was a uh, phys- he was a physicist. Okay, <clears throat> he was at a conference, physici- um, a physicist conference, and uh, all these guys were gathered around. I think in a social atmosphere, and uh, he would he would talk about Jesus. Okay. And these other guys, the other physicists would say, well, come on, you don't, you don't have to talk about Jesus. You don't have to do that stuff. You don't have to talk about Jesus. You're a great physicist, you know. You don't, you don't need all that stuff. And he said, how do you think I got to be a great physicist? I mean, he had the answer. Right. But see... People are embarrassed to talk about Jesus. Like, they could say God. That doesn't seem as em- em- embarrassing. Right. But to say Jesus, it's so personal. And he's so powerful. That there's something about it that people are really squeamish when it comes to talking about Jesus outside of church. Well, he maybe even in church. I don't know. Yeah, even in church. <laughs> I belong to a retirees club, and uh, they have meetings once a month, and we play bingo, and we have a sing, a, a sing some songs, and we play horse racing, and we do all these things, but we never talk about Jesus, you know? It's, uh, you, you're just not comfortable doing that. I mean, we are. And it's because of the the awakening of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that brings that relationship with Jesus. It's so it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But and through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, through a life in the Spirit seminar, that Spirit has been given control or. Be, be, became active in in your life so that we now are comfortable talking about Jesus or reading about Jesus or sharing about Jesus. Even, what my, I was saying, even my answering I'm, machine, if you call my phone number, after a few announcements it says, and remember that right. Jesus loves you. You know, I would have never, and people comment on that. And, I would have never done that 40 years ago. <laughs> I wouldn't even think about it, you know. Well, the problem is if you really aren't living in the power of the Holy Spirit, in other words, if uh, you haven't somehow the, these gifts and everything in your baptism were not stirred up, you can't see a miracle. You, you, don't, you can't even realize what Jesus is doing in your life. So... How can you talk about him even, see? I mean, there's nothing to talk about. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> so what, what are you going to talk about? You don't see Jesus doing anything because you aren't even aware of him. And then, and You're then, not aware of what... what and it's not that, 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 that I was a bad person before. No. Oh. And it's not that people, but if it's never spoken of, but just in, you just hear about Jesus in church through the readings or through the mass, yeah. then you're just listening to it. You're not conversing. You may say some prayers, you know, at mass, but it's not, hey, you know what Jesus did? Help me out last week, you know, I was stuck somewhere and, man, out of nowhere, you know, this person came to help me and, well, I thank Jesus for that. No, you say, boy, am I lucky I had this insurance that provided service to, to help me with my automobile, you know, it's all on a human level. It never recognizes that Christ is involved in your life. See, in the, the New Testament commands us to walk in the Spirit, 
Be filled with the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. Be led and guided by the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Minister under the anointing of the Spirit. Operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Worship in the Spirit. Manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Experience the communion of the Spirit and sing in the, in the, in the uh, Spirit. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit in our lives today? We need to allow him to take charge of our lives and we need to become, uh, become acquainted with him. We need to study and meditate on the relevance and the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's not happening other than in the Life in the Spirit seminar. Right. We have to, yeah. In other words, unless we're coming to the coming to our knees just on our own and saying, Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, you know, on that prayer that I that I used at the beginning, the Christian renewal prayer, if we're saying a prayer like this, release your spirit in me, stir up your spirit in me, baptize me with the fullness of your spirit, if we're saying that prayer, then there's a good chance it's going to start happening. I find new meaning in the sacraments, in the comfort in prayer. Love as you love and forgive as you forgive. And that's the problem with forgiveness. Yes. We're just not, we're not, uh, we're not convinced of it. You know, we're not convinced it's that important. Right. And how, you know, in heaven, it's pure love. It's pure love. There's no... That's right. It's pure love. God so is love. If, if I don't forgive someone, and that person is in heaven, how can I go to heaven until right. I forgive that person in heaven? That's right. I mean, I can't go into heaven and say, well, I don't want to be next to so-and-so because, you know, what he did to me, and, and therefore... I'm going to spend eternity in another part of heaven because, <laughs> you know, it sounds ridiculous because in heaven it's God, it's God's kingdom and it's pure love. It's pure love, which, you know, I guess we can't. I just read something, I just read something this morning that I never thought of before. And it came from uh, the Avala Institute out in California, Bob Lillis. Or at Anthony Lowe's. And he says, for example, if someone hurts you, Gene, you know, and he's got a problem too. Right. Because it wasn't right what he did. Right. So we not only have to forgive that person, but then we have to pray for them that God, uh, you know, opens the door so he can understand what he did. So we need to think of the other person that has hurt us and help him receive the mercy of God. Because he's got a problem because of what he did to you. Right. That's true. So we don't look at him as the, we don't look at him as the enemy. I mean, he's, he's hurting just like we are. Only his because what he did and us because what he did to us. And it's our responsibility, I was sharing with us again last night, it's our responsibility to forgive everyone, no matter what they do. But then pray for that other person so that they can be set free also. Because when you forgive, you're completely set free. And you're not separated from God. But if you're holding on to unforgiveness, you're separated from God, brother. Well, we know that Jesus said... You know, Father, forgive them when he was nailed to the cross in an excruciating pain, which we'll never experience, that he went through and was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Because if they knew what and they he were, was, they would have never And he was, interested in, he was also interested in helping them to find out and know what they're doing. 
Right. I hadn't thought about that second part a whole lot, but that makes a lot of sense now. Yeah. yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, when a person hurts you, Gene, I mean, you don't, you don't hate him. You feel sorry for him. Because he doesn't know what he's doing to hurt himself, and he has to. He has. We got to pray that he will realize that. Because we got to be concerned with his with his uh, uh, soul too. That's true. Very true. I don't know if you've ever looked at it that way. Isn't that an interesting way to look at it? No, I never have really. Yeah. I read that and I... uh, It's not only uh, forgiving him for doing that to you, but praying for him so that he's able to forgive himself, I guess, you know. Well, yeah, or realize what he did. Yeah. It's not up to us to, to really convince him what he did. That's up to God. Right. But we can help God to, to, uh, to, for him to receive mercy for what he did. Yes. Wow. But you probably have a lot yes. of with your radio station. <laughs> what you What's that? In forgiving people, right? Right. Well, I mean, um, I don't know. I, I, I started out when I gave my life to Jesus. That became a big thing with me, forgiveness. And I made a list of every person that had ever hurt me in my life. Some were even dead. Wow. Okay? And I forgave every person that had hurt me. And that was a good start for me. And then I had to make a list of everybody that I had hurt. (laughs) And uh, I think I told you this before. I made this list and I... I asked for forgiveness through Jesus. Wow. But then I'd be out on the street and I'd be walking along and the Lord would say, now that person, you have to go up to them. I had to actually go up to the person. Wow. And ask for forgiveness. Wow. Now you don't, I didn't do that, have to do that with everyone because you would just bring up old, you would just bring up old wounds, you know. Right, right. But if it was a serious one, then I had to go, I had, I had quite a few people that I had to go to. <laughs> How difficult was that? Well, one was really difficult because uh, there was a fellow that, in the, that was a public address announcer in uh, at the hockey rink where I broadcast, and oh. I would try to get a hold of him, and he and I would try to see him between the periods and that, and he would continue to say bad things, you know, when I was trying to <laughs> talk to him to ask for forgiveness. But he, I finally did. I, fi- I think it took about three times where I could actually talk to him, you know. And then he didn't say anything. He, he just accepted it and he was quiet. He didn't say a word. Wow. But then ever after that, we would say, hi, you know, how you doing? But, so we had a kind of a normal relationship. We never got to be great friends. No. You know? Well, I don't think that, that that is necessary per se. Yeah. No, but we, we, were, we were civil to each other then, see? Right. And we respected each other then. We never, there was no animosity anymore. Not on my part, for sure. So forgiveness is, uh, uh, people, uh, some people think that uh, that's about 80% of our problems, unforgiveness. Because it builds up a, uh, a root of bitterness. I had forgiven everybody and everything. I had that pretty well handled, but then I realized that I had resentment. Right. I still had some resentment. And uh, Dr. Rhonda Churvin at uh, Holy Apostles helped me with that. She had a program on how to get rid of resentment. And that helped me a lot. The other things, uh, 
Sometimes revenge doesn't that, that, What? When somebody hurts you, you want to revenge also, right? It wasn't. Yeah, that's what ha that's what usually happens. But it wasn't revenge so much, but it was just not having a good feeling towards some of those people. See, and I didn't want that either. No, I wanted to get rid of that resentment, and I did. I still have to work on a few things yet, but uh, <laughs> we all we, have, we all have. But uh, yeah, I mean, in that area, in that area. Right. Uh, the thing was that um, I think that the, for the most part, when I made those lists and everything, God delivered me. Wow. You know? And uh, but so, He doesn't deliver you completely. You know, it's kind of like Paul with his thorn right. in the side. Right. <laughs> God wants you to stay close to Him, so. <laughs> So yeah, you need him. I guess he doesn't want you to say, oh, that was easy. Thanks a lot. We'll see you. Yeah, I don't need you anymore now. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> see you later. But we can't do this stuff without the Holy Spirit and without grace. And we have to surrender. Yeah, we don't, you know, even in church, homilies, etc., of course, we don't hear much in, in the way of homilies, but we never hear that about the Holy Spirit, per se. You know, Not enough. Spend 15 minutes or 10 minutes talking about the Holy Spirit to the people. So I think most of the people don't understand what the role of the Holy Spirit. They think it's, it's in the sacraments, basically. You know, don't, you think that, uh, don't you think that people know you know, quite a bit about God and quite a bit about Jesus, but not so much about the Holy Spirit. Right, and that's that's a big issue. And I don't know how many people realize that the New Testament commands us to all that stuff that I mentioned. Walking in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, live in the Spirit. We don't hear that. No. No, we don't hear it. I don't know why. So that's why we're talking about it on this program. We, People have to know this. Father Cantal de Mesa wrote that beautiful article there. I'm thinking there's a little more to that article, and I may have cut it off. i got to re-look re that up if I can find it, because I think there's a little more. So... Uh, What's been happening with you? I know you um, are recovering from your double bypass. Right. And you're feeling pretty good. Yeah. And my cardiologist put me on, and, and I wanted to know if I could go back to my regular routine, per se, you know, and not watch everything I was doing. Or So yeah. I've been placed on, go ahead. <laughs> so You're doing your... Uh, Therapy for spelling. Yeah, that's that's physical, which is uh, which is good. You know, keep you in shape. Get now, when you were going all, through all this, uh, you kind of got surprised, so you really didn't have the time to respond to anything before your operation. Right. I, I was going to ask you where was Jesus in all of this, but you weren't really no, you weren't I, distressed or anything. Yeah, I you know. It, it, People were asking me. They said, "Oh my gosh, if I if I if I was there and I knew that they were going to open me up and you know uh, do bypass on my heart, I would have been you know devastated." And I said, "No, I didn't really. In fact, <laughs> I I guess the Lord was helping me out there. But I went in for an angiogram, and you know, and I met." I met somebody that had an angiogram. They said, well, you just go in in the morning and uh, you'll go through that procedure and they'll put this <laughs> wherever the blockage is and then, it, you know, you'll be back home in the evening. I said, whoa. Right. Okay. So when I woke up, they said, well, in two days you're going to go in for surgery for your heart. And I said, okay. You know, and the second day when I 
they wheeled me downstairs in, and they wheeled me to the operating room and the door was open and all the lights were on and the surgeon walked out and he said, well, we can't, I can't do that because we just had two emergencies came into the hospital and I, I have to take care of those. So maybe, maybe later tonight or tomorrow. <laughs> so they wheeled me back to my room and uh, I waited and then about 5 o'clock they said, well, he's not going to be able to do the surgery tonight, just have dinner and we'll do, he'll do it tomorrow. So again, I went through the whole procedure you know, get me prepared for surgery, wheel me. This time they really wheeled me into the operating room, and bingo, that was it. Well, so where was Jesus in all of this then? Well, you know, I think that it didn't, I don't know. I just, you know, went through this, and I just felt like, well, okay, this is, what, this is what's going to happen to me. And so I, you, did, you, I didn't worry about well, Nothing. Uh, nothing upset me. You know. I just. You re- you you accepted it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I just accepted that this is what I have to do, and I went to it. So, thank God, because I think you know, forty years ago, I would have really been upset. You know. Mm-hmm. Would have thought that I was dying because I, a lot of people told me that they said, "Oh my gosh," they said, "I would have been upset." They, you know, they wheeled you to the operating room, and then they. Say we can't do it now. We're going to wheel you back out, you know, <laughs> and then we'll bring you back tomorrow morning, you know. So all of this is happening, and yet I would get back to my room, and of course we had TV on the room, and I was able to get EWTN. So bingo, I watch EWTN <laughs> the whole time I was in bed, you know. Well, I think uh, this is what happened there. Where. Where, where uh, it says that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to take charge of our lives and we need to become acquainted with him. Well, when you do that, when you turn your life over to the Holy Spirit, who leads you to Jesus, then <clears throat> you, you, you've, you've pretty well given, a, given that away. I mean, you're, you're trusting now because right. you're, you're putting your trust in, uh, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, and, and and so he's going to give you he's going to give you peace, right? Yeah, I, I mean there will be some you know it depends on the person or whatever you know if people have different personalities, right? But generally, uh, you've turned over that part of your life, right? So you're not going to be that you're not going to be that devastated, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that because I. If you, I truly you have the trust. Yeah, because, it, it, you know, it was like, did you pray a lot? Did you, you know, did, uh, well, I had my rosary with me, and I did pray, yeah. you know, but. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, I was, you know, because all of this was going on, and it wasn't like, oh, my gosh, you know, they're going to open me up, and I'm going to be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I but, think. But uh, you t- you trusted your doctor too, didn't you? What? You trusted your doctor too. Right, right. Well, I didn't know who the surgeon was anyway. I mean, I. I oh, okay, know. but you, but you trusted the doctor that uh, was, had had. Uh, yeah. You know, sent you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the whole. Yeah, the whole right. thing. I went through very. You have the hope. Calmly and uh, and just accepted what was happening to me, you know. So I I think that the Holy Spirit being, you know, as much as it can be that I allow it in my life, that takes you through these circumstances. That's right. The Holy Spirit. Some people, you know, they could have had a heart attack before they went into surgery, you know. So. And remember the fellow we had last week, uh, uh, the, the the porno guy. You know, right. that was uh, was uh, uh, was not inflicted, but he was uh, addicted. He was addicted to pornography. It was the Holy Spirit that got him to that movie. Him and his brother. 
Right. And uh, that scene where Jesus was coming out of the cave just grabbed him. And that was the Holy Spirit. Right. And now that he started his recovery and uh, his conversion, now he wants to know more about the Holy Spirit. So he's actually going through a Life in the Spirit seminar. He's been attending a prayer group, but he's attending this Life in the Spirit seminar over at uh, St. Aloysius there in Southington, Connecticut. And uh, that's the way the Holy Spirit works. He gets a piece of you, you know, gets you started because he wants you to, you know, have the fullness. He wants you to have the fullness of life. In John 10.10 10, it says, I want you to have life and I want you to have life abundantly. Not this garbage that so many people are going through, huh? Right. Well, look at Paul, you know, St. Paul. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit, did, you know, took him to trials that, you know, once he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, his whole life was transformed. Instead of right. the Jews, you know, he was converting oh, them. Look at He was converting he actually, them. Yeah, and he had uh, he had renounced God. Right. He had renounced Jesus. And he got him turned around, and then he nothing could bother him after that. When he had got the fullness of the Holy Spirit, not you know uh, persecution, uh, irritation, uh, whatever. He said he didn't react to any of that stuff. Right. He didn't have to forgive anybody because he didn't. He, he was, you know, free from unforgiveness. Yeah, it was just. And that's the way we. Want. That's the only way we're going to have peace. Can you imagine if the whole church was alive in the spirit? You know. Exactly. I mean, just... What 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 the world would be. But God's at work, so we just have to trust. We're just a remnant. And we hope right? That, right. We're just... But it's okay. What we have to face, we may have to face uh, persecution. We get some persecution now, but it's pretty minor. You know us here in this country, right? So uh, uh, I just maybe just kind of I almost finished here, but uh, this is the book, the Baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's put out by International. Yeah, Christ. we got about we got about seven minutes. It's uh, Baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's a book. The name of the book is Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Interna it's put out by the International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Services. Yes, yeah. I love that book. I love that book. Yeah. And I, I just highlighted this, and I'll just read that. Thus, among the fruits of baptism in the Spirit are many signs of creativity in worship, a newfound ability to formulate God's praise in one's own language, among the less educated as well as the better educated, the widespread reception of the gift of tongues, primarily as a gift of pra for prayer and praise, the phenomena, the phenomena of corporate singing in the spirit, and an explosion of new songs and melodies expressing praise, the praise of God. People baptized in the Spirit testify to this new thirst for prayer, scripture, and the sacraments. I think this is the best line we have for the charismatic renewal. People baptized in the Spirit testify to a new thirst for prayer, scripture, and the sacraments. That's a, new, 
A new thirst. A new thirst. That's what right. we need. Everyone needs it in the church. Everyone. Right. A new thirst. And isn't that true? I mean, we're yes. going to fight to that, both of us. And anyone that... Well, we have a... We have a Bible Institute in Cincinnati every every summer. It's usually the end of July through the first of uh, August. Mm. And when uh, we're we're singing in tongues at that Bible Institute, I mean it's just amazing of the uh, you know how it comes together, and you think they were they were being directed by somebody, but the Holy Spirit brings it together, and it's just beautiful. It's all in uh, harmony, you know? Right. I mean, we're talking about, you know, two, three hundred people praying and singing in tongues. And there's no director or anything. There was no director. There was no founder of the Holy Spirit either. You know, I mean, as far as a man or a group. Right. It came right from God, right? Right. <laughs> There's nobody recognized as the founder of the of the Life in the Spirit seminar. You know, no group. No. It just happened. It just happened. Yeah, that's beautiful. So that that's where the people that's what the what the people need. I know I needed it, and, right. and you needed it. I wouldn't so, be in Connecticut if it wasn't for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I don't know where I'd be. I don't know if I'd be laying on the street corner somewhere. Wow. Really? I mean, we weren't the nicest guys, you know. We changed. Right. And that's what the Holy Spirit can do, just like he changed that man last week. And many others that we know. Perform miracles with us. And, and just leave with maybe this, uh, I just on the next page it says, people who were previously far from the Lord or received the sacraments only out of habit, now experience them as a wellspring of life and desire to receive them regularly. Yeah, that's beautiful. Read that again. Read that again. People who were previously far from the Lord or received the sacraments only out of habit now experience them as wellspring of life and desire to receive them regularly. And more often, you know, I mean, all of a sudden, you know, I go to confession, like, not twice a year, but often. Right. And and Eucharist came, you know, in fact, I receive Eucharist um, eight times a week, because if we go to Mass on, I go to Mass on Saturday morning, and then if... The wife wants to go to Mass on Saturday afternoon, so we go there. And then I would wake up on Sunday, and I would say, Sunday is not like I'm missing Mass, so I would go to a different church. You know, That's right. But, but I go on Sunday <laughs> again, so I'm going to right. for seven days a week, you know. So and It's not a habit. Who's doing that? You know, it's the whole right. thing that's driving me there. It's not Gene Dion. You know, it's just you ever, you ever uh, in the morning, you don't want to get up? You know, you're tired, you don't want to get up? Right. There's no way I can stay in bed. I mean, I have to go to daily math. Right, right. There's no way I can, I, I mean, it doesn't make any difference whether I feel like getting up or not, i got to get up, you know, unless I'm sick. Right. Okay, this is it. So this is the end of um, our Life in the Spirit for this week. We'll be back again next week, same time, same station. Say that uh, Holy Spirit prayer again that you said, come Holy Spirit.
I've got two books here. <laughs> okay. Well, no, hold on. I think we're out of time now. So I'll just say, okay. uh, Lord, uh, may you, oh, fa- Father, may you bless each and every one of you, every one of us, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Gene. Okay. God bless, Bob. See you later. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.